Discernment is the ability to differentiate, to identify, to distinguish, to separate one thing from another. Discernment means to tell the difference between things that sometimes seemingly look alike but actually are not. When it is used in theology or in Christian language, it is the ability of understanding God's word well enough that you are able to tell the difference between truth and error, between right and wrong, and sometimes the difference between what is right and what is almost right, but not really right. This is a week where we ask ourselves, what is it that we really believe? When I say I am a Christian, what am I talking about? What makes me different from a Buddhist, from a Hindu, or from a Muslim, or from someone else who's non-Christian? Number two, it's not just the what of my faith. It's also the why of my faith. Why do I believe what I believe? It's one thing to say you are a Christian until you are asked to make a case for your Christianity. And then you start, uh, you know, really, actually, anyway, you see Christianity is actually complicated. Anyway, just believe God understands. Very many Christians are at that place in their faith. But thirdly, it's, this week is about understanding the how-to of communicating our faith. I may know what I believe and why I believe it, but how do I communicate it with people who may not agree with me, who may misunderstand what Christianity really is, who may have never heard of it before, or have a biased view of Christianity, how do I communicate my faith comparingly, courageously, compassionately, and winsomely? This is what this week is about. As you have heard, Reverend Paul, our missioners will be coming to you to talk to you, to give you information, to challenge the information that you already have or know, but even more importantly, to resource you with the tools necessary that you may be confident of your Christian faith and you may be able to stand firm for it, this faith that has been given to the saints once for all. We go to our passage, 2 Corinthians, as we continue to, stand, to understand this. And my topic today is the challenge of false teachings and the opportunity we have as believers to engage false teachers or followers of false teachers to understand God's truth and stand firm in it. The passage that was read was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. You should know that in the first century, going to church was not cultural. We di people didn't go to church because their parents went there. They didn't go to church because they were raised in Christianity because it was a new faith. So people who came to church were people who were converted and convinced believers, people who had had an encounter with Jesus Christ and could proudly identify themselves as saints and followers of Jesus. So when you think of the church at Corinth, think of a body of believers, saints, men and women who have already confessed Christ Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord. But then you should be concerned that to a church of believers like this, the Apostle Paul should write to them about the danger of false teachers. You would think that being believers, they already know what is true and can identify it from what is false. Sadly, the Apostle Paul says that's the problem, that you can actually be a believer who does not understand truly what you believe, that you can be a believer who is vulnerable to deception, that you can be a believer who sincerely, innocently, ignorantly believes a lie and there are consequences for lies. If Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, the reverse is equally true. That if you subscribe to lies or to deception, it will keep you in bondage. Now you understand why the Apostle Paul would be saying, 
I am afraid. I am concerned, brothers. I am jealous for you. My goal was to present you as a pure bride to Christ. But as it stands, you guys are far from what it means to be pure. And that concerns me. And then he goes further in verse 3. And he compares the danger of the concern to the experience of Eve. He takes them back way to the Garden of Eden where it all begins. And he says, I am concerned that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent, you too are about to be deceived. Not only does he remind us that the battle between truth and error has been going on since the Garden of Eden and continues to be one that is unrivaled, but he reminds us that we are susceptible to, de to attack to, of deception and the schemes of the evil one. Now, the Apostle Paul's illustration does not make sense until you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and ask yourself, what really happened in the garden? Now I know many of us have vague ideas of what happened there. The woman came in the garden, he ate the fruit that he was, she was not supposed to eat. The devil deceived her and because God was very mad at Eve and Adam, he brought a curse on them and that's the beginning of the trouble of the world. As much as the facts, the, the details actually sound factual, they actually are not. It's not what really was happening in the garden. What we find in the garden is not a case of a confused woman who is deceived by the serpent and disobeys God. What we find in the garden of Eden is a problem of lack of discernment. You notice that Satan does not come in the garden and introduce himself as Satan. Normally you would have expected him to come with his big CV. After all, he was an angel. Clear his voice <coughs> and introduce himself. I am Satan, the ark of angels. And you see, I used to live in heaven, but God was limiting me a bit. So I decided to handle matters in my own hands. As it turns out, he doesn't like me anymore. In fact, I am now the ultimate boss of myself. Let me tell you something. This guy, God, is not someone you need to trust. You know what? Actually, why don't you follow me together? After all, I have hell where I'm going, and we can live there forever. No, Satan could have said that. But I doubt that Eve would have listened or even followed him to the end of the conversation. So what does Satan do? Satan comes in the garden and first and foremost acknowledges the wonders of God's creation in the paradise. He acknowledges that God is good. The only problem is that he did not tell Eve everything that she needed to know. So he says, Eve, did God really say, and the key word there is the word really. Did God really say, and then he distorts what God had said. That you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Then Eve begins to say, well, he actually said we can eat of any tree except the one in the middle. But the word really keeps ringing in Eve's mind. Eve, are you sure you understood God well? What if he was actually joking and he wanted to see how you respond? Eve, what is God hiding from you that he could give you all the trees in the garden except that one? What is the secret God that you are not telling me? Curiosity is getting the better of her. And Satan says, ah, Eve, you worry too much. In fact, let me tell you, you see me, I was an angel in heaven, so there are things I know that you guys don't know. He comes close and whispers in her ear perhaps and says, Eve, did you know? That if you ate from that tree, you will actually not die. Nah, you, God, God is too good. He wouldn't just kill you like that. You know, in fact, let me tell you something. If you eat of that tree, you will be like God. If did you hear that? You will be like. Wow. God is good. He gave you the garden. He made you as a wonderful creature. But what if there was an opportunity to be like the creator? Wouldn't you want to take it? 
Can you imagine what life looks like upstairs instead of hanging around in the trees of Eden? Now you would be coming down from the clouds. And Eve is visualizing what a possibility. Remember the devil is not saying God is bad. The devil is saying God could have done more. He has already done good, but he could have given you better and best. Eve's greed takes advantage of her. Eve is a woman who knows the truth, but the lie seems more appetizing than what she knew before. And before she knew it, she had seen the fruit, she had touched the fruit, she had eaten the fruit, and like they say, the rest is history. Paul says, Corinthian brothers, I am afraid for you because just like Eve was deceived by the serpent, you are about to be led astray. How are you going to be led astray? Satan is not going to come and this time introduce himself. He will still come like the way he did in the Garden of Eden. In verse 4, the apostle Paul shows them how he comes. He says that for if someone comes and preaches another Jesus that we did not preach to you, or a different spirit that you did not receive, or a different gospel, you easily, you readily accept him. And in that one sentence, Paul says there is another Jesus. There is a different spirit at work. There is a different gospel. Not everything you hear is the true biblical gospel. Not everybody who says they believe in Jesus necessarily believe the Jesus as described in the scriptures. What is going on here in verse 4 is that everything seems to be business as usual on the surface, but underneath the snake of deception is glaring its head. You notice that these false preachers do not come and preach something new. No, they bring the old teaching that these believers already know. They use the same Christian terminology and vocabulary. They apply the same dictionary but with a different meaning. They are still proclaiming Jesus but not the one of the Bible. They are still proclaiming the gospel, but a different one that does not save. They still claim to be coming under the power of the spirit. The only difference is that that spirit is not the Holy Spirit. Same language, same terminology, same traditions. They may even open the Bible and read Bible verses, by the way. But twist them, misapply them, misinterpret them. And the end has nothing to do with what God's word says. And Paul says essentially that you Corinthian brothers, unless you learn to exercise discernment, unless you develop the ability to distinguish between what is and what looks like but is not, you are about to be deceived. In verses 13 and up to 15, The Apostle Paul talks about the root of deception. And he says that for such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. They are not apostles of the devil. They are masquerading as apostles of Christ. Many people, when we talk about false teachers and false churches, they come and say, ah, come on, how do you know that these churches are there? How can I tell you that that church is a cultic group or not? And what they are essentially saying is, I have never found a church whose name is the cultic church of Satan. Of course there is none. There is not a day when you are ever going to find a church that says, the synagogue of hell. <laughs> the church of Lucifer. It's not going to be there because many will not join it. It's going to have very wonderful, attractive, nicely advertised, flamboyant names that when you read them, you begin to think that you who goes to St. Peter's, you are missing a point. (laughs) Hmm. These guys are going to the heavenly assembly visionary church. And for you, where do you go? St. James Cathedral. Come on. Wake up. 
It sounds as though these guys are in first class and you are in economy at the back of the flight, just right there. You feel like you are second class and you are like, what took me so long to join them? But what you don't know is that the labels do not necessarily reflect who they are. False teachers don't come with a satanic Bible. They come with our normal, ordinary Bibles. It's not that they are reading from some other book necessarily, even though many cultic groups have other additional books. But in most cases, they are playing around with the scriptures, reading them selectively, interpreting them according to their own uh, doctrines and teachings, inserting things in the Bible that are not supposed to be there, discrediting the authority of scripture, sometimes even hiding behind visions and revelations and prophecies. The Lord spoke last night, why would I want to be reading an ancient book, the Bible? And who doesn't want fresh revelation from last night? And so believers have put Bibles down and they are now listening to the man of God or whoever will claim to be a prophet. And Paul says, brothers, I am concerned. You are about to be led astray and especially because deception is not obvious. It doesn't always come and introduce itself directly to you. And that's why Jesus in Matthew seven fifteen told his followers and said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. On the outside they look like sheep, gentle, lovely, harmless. You want to pet them, you want to carry them around. But Jesus says, watch out. Because while on the outside they may look like sheep, on the inside they are wolves and they are eager to devour and to destroy. In Matthew, the same chapter, when you read from verses 21 to around 23, Jesus takes it even much further. He says that many will come to me on that day and they will say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We preached in your name. We prophesied in your name. And Jesus will say, go away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Now that is a very troubling verse. How is it possible that these guys have been casting out demons and prophesying and preaching and Jesus doesn't know them? So if Jesus is not the one who gave them the power, who did? Is it possible that one can have power and even pray for you and you get healed but he's actually not a man of God? You go to Matthew 24, verse 24. Jesus again is warning about the signs of the end. He says, many false Christs and false prophets will arise. They will perform signs and wonders, if possible, to deceive even the elect, the chosen ones of God, believers. That false teachers have an ability to perform signs and wonders. The goal is not to draw you into the kingdom, but to deceive you out of the kingdom. Now, this is serious. We live in a generation today where we measure the power of God by the amount of miracles and signs and wonders. Today, the man who prays and people get healed is the one who will have a full church. Today, the man who prophesies something and it happens, even if he researched about you from Facebook, he is likely to be followed and believed. And in a generation like ours, it is very easy to be deceived, to be sincerely lost while you are thinking you have found the way more than others. Very possible. Today, churches where the pastor is not charismatic, does not speak inspiringly, even when he exposes the truth of God's word faithfully, that church is bound to be empty. We are looking for drama and comedy. We are looking for entertainment and acrobatics. We are looking for people who tell us what our itching ears want to hear, even though we know what they are saying may not be true. We prefer to be lied to than told the truth. We prefer to have the moment and the instant of excitement at the expense of what is really eternal. What good is it if you gain those miracles, but then you end up in eternal hell? That's why Jesus would say that you would rather go to heaven with one eye 
than to have two in the fires of hell. These false teachers may promise a lot. They may even perform miracles and wonders, by the way. But you need to keep remembering that even miracles have an expired date. Someday you won't need miracles. In heaven there will be total ultimate healing. No one is going to need a miracle. We need to keep remembering that. And we need to keep remembering that no matter what miracle you receive, it doesn't matter from whom or how big, one of these days you are going to die. And I trust you, there is no miracle against death. If you do not believe me, you look for Lazarus, whom Jesus raised in John chapter 11. Do you know where he stays? He's dead. Did he receive a miracle? Sure. Is he alive? No. If I was Lazarus, I would be wondering, why did I have to die two times? Was the first one not enough? I don't know how big that miracle is where you have to die twice. If you think about it, you begin to realize maybe it was not even worth pursuing. Many of us are pursuing miracles and even when we get those miracles, they are the ones that may actually become our curse. You hear somebody saying, me, I want, um, I want you to pray for me. I want to be a doctor. But he has not gone to school. Would you like to have a doctor who became one by a miracle treating you? Would you like a pilot who never went for any pilot training and he tells you that for him the Holy Spirit has trained him? Would you comfortably be in that plane? So how come that when it comes to natural things of life, we are very careful and discerning, but when we come to matters of God that affect our eternity, we are so gullible. It's like when you come to church, there is an invisible sign which says, do not think the pastor has already done it for you. Why do we play around with eternal matters, yet we take with seriousness the things of life? For you to become a lawyer, you must study rigorously. Forget this business of joking. You must study rigorously, sleep less, sometimes even not eat. And even when you become a lawyer, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a good one. <laughs> but you know, when it comes to preaching, they tell you, ah, leave the men of God, God has called them. They don't have to go to Bible school. They don't need theology. Really? The lawyer needs to study law so that he can go and defend criminals who are even guilty, by the way. But the pastor who is going to proclaim the wonders of God that affect your eternity, it's okay, he can wake up in the morning, grab the Bible and tell you whatever he really thinks. Do you see the twisting that is happening in our generation? Today when you talk about a pastor who is preaching error, it is believers who shut you down first. Why are you attacking the man of God? Do you think he has to be a theologian like everybody? Of all the nice things he has said, how come you are only talking about the wrong statement he made? But if that statement affects your eternity, why would I keep quiet when you are about to perish? How come that the man of God is excused for his theological ignorance, but when you go to work in any other workplace, you must present your competence papers, which is more important. We need to be serious, brothers and sisters. Matters of Christianity are matters of life and death. And any error could endanger you for all eternity. And that is why a ministry like Akfa goes out day in and out, conducts research across the continent so that we can provide information for you that you will not be led into error by people who appear to be Christian but actually are not. That's the reason we exist, to resource you. That's the reason we are here this week. To challenge you to rethink your faith. Are you sure you have believed the truth? Or is it possible that you could be in some emotional excitement that has been Christianized, but really not established on the truth of scripture? Would you like to live the rest of your life and then one day at the end of your life, you realize all the years you spent thinking you were a Christian were actually a lie because you were in a cult? 
Are you aware that many people don't even have the opportunity to go that far? Because you see, cults don't just deceive you in terms of beliefs, but they even affect you in terms of your behaviors. Not a day goes by without receiving a call or a story from someone whose marriage has broken because one of the couples joined the cult. I know marriages that have been broken because the pastor said that the partner you married was not God's will for you. So drop him or her, come to our church, we shall give you the man that God has chosen for you. How many people have lost their monies or even left their jobs in the pursuit of some spiritual excitement only to realize they were conned out of all their savings? Are you aware that there are people who have committed suicide because they believe the lie and when they finally found out the truth, it was too much for them to handle? Do you know that today we have a rising generation of atheists, young men and women who were at one time passionately Christian but along the way have been deceived by the distortions of false teachers and now they have given up on Christianity. Those who were promised cars and visas and spouses and, and things didn't happen. Instead of realizing that the pastor lied to them, they think it's God who failed them. What is the conclusion? I tried Christianity. It didn't work. Therefore, I am turning my back on everything to do with God. But was God the problem? No. They were victims of deception. And Paul says, I am afraid. You are about to be deceived. And the question is, how do we avoid this deception? Paul began by saying, you need to learn to discern, to differentiate, to tell the difference between truth and error, between right and wrong. And for you to exercise discernment well, you must be discipled. You cannot know what is wrong if you don't know what is true. There has to be a standard. So the battle for our faith begins with the grounding in Christian teaching. Understanding the what and the why of your faith. So that you can ably identify error and you can confidently answer those who oppose the Christian faith. If you are not studying your Bible and you don't know what God has said, how can you know whether what your pastor is saying is from God or not? But if you know what the Bible says and your pastor says what contradicts it, you are able to say, mm -mm -mm, wait a minute, the Bible says this, but the pastor is saying this. And when there is a conflict between the Bible and the pastor, what do you follow? The inspired word of God, the eternal word of God. You cannot exercise discernment well if you are not discipled in biblical truth. And that's where it begins. Believers are hungry for truth. Believers able to interpret the scriptures for themselves without depending on the vision and the revelation from the pastor or the man of God. Believers who take charge of their faith go to the scriptures by themselves, search them carefully and diligently and make sure that they stand in line with the standard of God's unchanging word. If you are not discipled, you cannot discern well. And if you cannot discern well, you cannot defend your faith from deception. It is only after you have seen that there is a problem that you want to correct it. So if you are not discerning, what are you defending? Today we have so many people involved in the defense, except that it is the defense of falsehood. Today if you say a certain man or a certain church has some theological errors, they will attack you like greedy wolves. How dare you? They will defend their prophet to their death. But are they defending him according to the teaching of scripture? Or are they defending him emotionally? Or are they defending him because they are scared that if he turns out to be a liar, they will have wasted their years believing a lie? You have to come back to the teaching of scripture. Whether it is an apostle or a pastor, whoever speaks in the name of God must be held accountable by his teachings being compared to what the Bible is saying. How I pray that during this week as you interact with us and several other believers, that you will develop a burden to know God's truth. That you will yearn for that ability to discern. That you will desire to be the kind of man and woman who contends for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. May the Lord bless you.